Iraqi president's motives and his similarities to other leaders in history. Dr. Gerald M. Post, is Saddam Hussein really the madman of the Middle East that, that he's been painted to be by others? I think it's a very unfortunate title because it portrays him as being unpredictable, uh, erratic, and psychotic, and nothing could be further from the truth. In point of fact, he is judicious, thoughtful, reflective, not impulsive, but he is often out of touch with political reality and has often miscalculated. Is there any evidence of psychological disorder? There is evidence of certain personality disorder, but not severe uh, psychiatric uh, disorder in the sense of someone who needs to be in the hospital. He is somewhat paranoid. Uh, he is uh, certainly grandiose. He certainly has dreams of glory. Uh, but this is uh, uh, not a man who is, uh, who is crazy. Good evening. We're very pleased to have with us Dr. Gerald M. Post, professor of psychiatry, political psychology, and international affairs at George Washington University. We're taking a look at the psychological profile of Saddam Hussein. If you have a question or comment for our guest, our lines will be open for you in just a moment. If you're watching us in the Eastern or Central time zones, you can reach C-SPAN by calling 202-628-2525. If you're watching us from the Pacific or Mountain Time Zones, our number is there, 202-783-2727. And if you're watching C-SPAN from outside the United States, our international lines are open as well, and that number is on your screen. Dr. Post, how long have you been looking at uh, Saddam Hussein's background? He's someone whom, I'm, whom I have uh, followed for many years, and I think there really is a, uh, a great consistency uh, to him over the years and a lot of predictable features. Give us a thumbnail sketch of his background, starting with his childhood and his parents. Well, that's, a, that's an important question because I think some of these features really can be traced back to his childhood. He was uh, born in 1937, but his father died before he was born, uh, already a, a, a problem of some degree. His paternal uncle married his mother, which was the tradition in the area, but he really didn't fully bond to this family. At age 10, demonstrating the capacity of this man to uh, uh, know what he wants and go out after it, he was really quite impressed by a little boy in the village who knew how to read and write. He asked his parents if he could go and become educated. His parents turned him down. He would not take no for an answer, and in the middle of the night stole away to the uh, village of his um, of his maternal uh, uncle, Kairala. This was a real turning point for young Saddam, because his uncle was this really fiery nationalist who had been uh, jailed for uh, uh, his uh, participation in 1941 in the abortive uh, Iraqi uprising against the B British mandate. And uh, Kairala filled the young uh, uh, Saddam with tales of the heroism of his great-grandfather and his great-uncles who died defending Iraq's honor. Most interestingly, uh, in 1982, uh, Saddam published in the honor of his grandfather, who had gone on, of his uncle, who had gone on to become the uh, um, governor of Baghdad, a pamphlet titled, Three Whom God Should Never Have Created, Persians, Jews, and Flies. And this feeling about the Persians and the Jews, I'm not sure about the flies, uh, has, uh, has persisted to this day. He intensely hates them. Who were some of the uh, Arab leaders who shaped his thinking and particularly had an influence on his nationalist leanings? Well, he very much for, uh, has been influenced in particular uh, by Nasser. He came to Baghdad uh, in the very year, 1952, that uh, Nasser led the Free Officers' Revolution and overthrew the corrupt King Farouk. So that Nasser, who had this mantle of pan-Arab leader, uh, became a real hero and model for him. This week, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, made headlines around the world for a rather unusual media 
event that he held with the British children and other British uh, hostages, if you will. Um, when you watched that uh, newsreel, did that uh, demonstrate anything that you've been observing in terms of his personality? Well, to me, the most interesting thing it demonstrated uh, was how out of touch he is with uh, Western society. If he had the notion that this was somehow going to have a positive influence um, on uh, the Western viewer, viewer. He was uh, sadly mistaken, and that, that's worth noting. Uh, he has had almost no experience with the West. He traveled briefly in 1976 to France. His only sustained experience with non-Arabs has been um, uh, with his Soviet military advisors. So he d has a very imperfect understanding of the Western world. When you look at the revolutionary behavior that he has displayed over the years, um, how does he justify some of his actions that on the surface may be difficult for outsiders to uh, understand? He justifies any action uh, in the service of the revolution and uh, what he uh, calls the extremities of the, uh, of the revolution. But in point of fact, if you get beneath his ideological rationalization, I believe that the basic uh, ideology that drives Saddam Hussein is an intense loyalty to Saddam Hussein. What Saddam needs, Saddam will get. What stands in his way will be eliminated, and there is no length to which he will not go to pursue those goals. Along the lines, in a paper that you recently wrote about Saddam Hussein, you told a story of Abdul Razaz al-Nayaf. Is, right. Can you tell that story very quickly? This is a, a kind of interesting uh, example of his loyalty to, uh, to friends and helpers. Uh, a crucial uh, assistance was provided to him by the chief of uh, military intelligence, uh, 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 Raif. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the coup of 1968 could not have been successful without the information provided uh, by him to, uh, uh, to Saddam Hussein. As reward for services rendered, uh, two weeks after the successful coup, um, uh, Saddam uh, both ordered the arrest uh, of Naif, had him uh, sent off to exile, and then ordered his assassination while he was away. Um, how is he uh, perceived among the people of Iraq? Do you have a sense of that? Well, this is a, an interesting question. Um, this is something that has puzzled many, many people in the West. How could this man have such a following? I would identify him as one of the destructive charismatics. And by that I mean someone who unifies his people by the strength of his leadership. To be charismatic, it helps to be a little bit paranoid, which uh, uh, Saddam Hussein is. And to have someone who says, it's not us, it's them, they, the, uh, the uh, sheikhs of Kuwait, or they, the imperialist leaders of uh, the United States, they are our problem, and if you will stick with me, we will rise to our destiny. That's a very powerful message uh, to send uh, uh, to a downtrodden people. How does he see his role emerging in the Middle East? Well, he has what some have called a Saladin uh, complex. He sees himself as the preeminent leader in the model uh, of Nasser, and uh, and uh, very much has as a goal uh, dominating the region. In case you've just joined us, we're visiting with Dr. Gerald M. Post, a professor of psychiatry, political psychology, and international affairs at George Washington University. We're taking a look at the psychology of Saddam Hussein. If you have a question or comment, our lines are open. The numbers are on the screen. Again, if you've called C-SPAN within the past 30 days, we'd ask that you'd not call during this program. When you look at um, the background of Saddam Hussein, do you have any opinions about what he's likely to do next? Well, let me make two points in response to that. And one of these is especially important to emphasize. It, he is seen in many quarters as being someone who is uh, sort of this irresistible force who will not stop, who uses whatever aggression is necessary. And to an extent, that is true. This is not a man burdened by conscience. He will do whatever is necessary to get his goals. But he has, on three separate occasions, most recently last week indeed, backed off from a major uh, uh, course of action when he has considered that he's uh, miscalculated. In 1975, uh, he did this. In 1982, he did this. And most recently, last week, 
he had committed himself to never giving up control over the disputed Shad al Arab uh, waterway. And indeed, when uh, he needed those 500,000 troops, he gave in to all of Iran's demands. There's an interesting story in today's Washington Times that talks about uh, despots often drawn to kids and shows pictures of several uh, despots, Mussolini uh, and other Stalin and so forth, all embracing children to show that they are uh, warm and friendly. Again, do you see any pattern between uh, Saddam Hussein's well, this behavior? Is certainly a, a deeply touching uh, a story. And uh, watching last night that really quite bizarre uh, a press conference with the hostages and the children and the body language of the children, especially Stuart, who was absolutely terrified, uh, one had to think that another photo should have been on the uh, screen in parallel with that, the photo of the victims of the uh, poison gas uh, in, uh, uh, in the Kurdish uprising and the many children who were, who were killed by that. Before we go to the phones, do you have a sense of what lengths he'll go to to achieve his goals? For example, if he had access to nuclear weapons, do you think he's above uh, using them? If he believes he has a way out, he can back off. If he believes that his, uh, his uh, position in power is at stake, there's no lengths to which uh, uh, he will not uh, go. Any weapons at his disposal he will use. He will use uh, the human shield that he has already demonstrated. Dr. Gerald M. Post is our guest. We're taking a look at the psychology of Saddam Hussein. Our first call is Richfield, New Jersey. Nice to hear from you. Go ahead. Uh, hi. I would like to yeah. know, uh, I think all the political leaders... Excuse me. Can you start over? We're having a little problem with the audio. Can you start over again? Start you might, over again? You might turn the uh, knob up. Turn your knob up. Here you go. Let's see. How's that? Can you hear it? Go ahead. Hello. Okay. Hello. Go ahead. We hear you. Hi. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, I think all the political leaders... Uh, throughout the world uh, have uh, some paranoia uh, and uh, are ambitious for... Do you hear me? Uh, I'm s go ahead. We're, uh, go ahead. We're hearing you. We're, we're going to bring it through another way. Go right ahead. Do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead, okay. please. Okay. I want to know what, diff what, what makes him different. Being paranoid and ambitious, ambition for, uh, and having an ambition for power what makes him different than all the other leaders uh, throughout the world? And how do you compare him to George Bush wanting also to, be, to have America being as the leadership, uh, being as, as a leader in the whole world? All right, thanks for the call. Well, I think it's really uh, an absurdity uh, to put Saddam Hussein and George Bush into the uh, uh, same category. To be sure, uh, uh, talented individuals, uh, uh, with ambition will reach for the highest. There is no constraint upon Saddam Hussein. He will kill, he will lie, he will deceive, and that is certainly in contrast with the leaders of the Western world. You say he will kill. Um, in your paper, you talk about some instances where he has acted rather uh, uh, harshly with some of the people who are very close to him. Can you give us an example of right, and his this brutality? This brutality is very important because Saddam Hussein rules by, uh, by fear. Uh, one very interesting example, in 1982, when the war was going very badly uh, for Iraq with Iran, uh, Saddam Hussein decided they really should uh, cease, uh, cease the war and, if possible, disengage. But by this time, Khomeini was obsessed with Saddam Hussein and made the point that he would not uh, accept peace until Saddam Hussein was deposed. Saddam Hussein called for a cabinet meeting, asked his cabinet advisors, what should I do? Everyone at first said, uh, oh, oh, a wondrous leader, uh, you, you surely must stay on as our leader, you must not step down. He says, no, I want your candid reflections. And taking him seriously, uh, a Dr. Ibrahim, his minister of health, said, well, perhaps you should consider stepping down temporarily uh, until peace has been achieved, and then you can resume the presidency. Saddam gravely thanked uh, Dr. Ibrahim for his candor and had him arrested. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim's wife pled uh, with Saddam to uh, return her husband to him. He promised that he would, and indeed this is one promise he kept. Indeed, he returned uh, Dr. Ibrahim to his wife in a black canvas body bag chopped into little pieces. And I want to emphasize the effects of this. 
is powerfully concentrated the attention of the other ministers who found that they had no doubts about uh, Saddam Hussein's capacity for leadership and were unswervingly loyal to him from that time on. New Orleans, Louisiana, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to ask the doctor uh, if he sees uh, any type of similarity between uh, two leaders in the Middle Eastern region that uh, are uh, at the focal point right now, perhaps maybe not Assad, President Assad of Syria, as much as uh, President Saddam Hussein. They're both uh, leaders that have known to uh, open fire on their own uh, people uh, in order to keep their uh, seat uh, in power. Uh, I would like to the doctor to perhaps uh, give us a view if he sees any similarity between the two leaders and uh, perhaps uh, their views. That's uh, an excellent question. Indeed, there are uh, certain similarities, but some very important differences, too. Both uh, Haifaz al-Assad, uh, president uh, of Syria, uh, and uh, Saddam Hussein are members of the Ba'ath Party. They both share uh, a common ideology. Indeed, Assad was successful uh, in his coup in Syria before Saddam Hussein uh, took power. Uh, interestingly, Saddam Hussein became intensely rivalrous uh, with uh, Assad uh, at this time. And the reason for this is because there's room for only one dominant leader in the region, and destiny has inscribed his name as Saddam Hussein. They are bitter opponents and rivals for the same seat. One of the differences is, though, that uh, Assad is surrounded by a group of leaders of similar mind, colleagues with whom he plans and shares. There is no one around uh, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, he stands alone because he's eliminated anyone who is a threat to his power. Well, if there are no people who are around who can talk to him, uh, where does he get his influences from today? Well, he receives information, but really quite imperfectly. And thus, in terms of the question, is he a madman? The answer is no. He's psychologically in touch with reality, but he can be politically very out of touch with reality because no one dares contradict him. No one dares correct his, uh, his misperceptions. No one uh, dares uh, stand up and say the course you're on is leading to destruction. San Diego, California. Thanks for calling. Go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if you could comment on a report I saw on the radio that um, Hussein got a law degree by gunpoint. And a second question, I'm also curious if any government agencies have asked your opinion on his uh, insight into his character. Uh, Saddam got a law degree during his period in exile in Egypt. Uh, I'm not familiar with it uh, being by gunpoint, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, several of his professors found him an intimidating uh, uh, student. Uh, government agencies uh, do indeed uh, benefit from personality profiles uh, of world leaders. Uh, the profile I've provided uh, uh, is one uh, that comes from open sources and, uh, and is, is not related to government work, however. Related to that, we introduced you as being a professor of psychiatry, political psychology, and international affairs at George Washington University. Can you tell us, in a nutshell, what you do there? Uh, what I've attempted to do is to examine the relationship between the worlds of psychology and politics, the, the influences uh, upon leadership, uh, of personality factors, the psychology of terrorism, uh, crisis decision making. It's really a quite fascinating field and indeed it's a, uh, it's a program we're, we're initiating at the graduate level uh, at George Washington University. We're talking about the psychological profile of Saddam Hussein. Our guest is Dr. Gerald M. Post. Let's go back to the phones. Honolulu, Hawaii. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I would like to ask you uh, what your thought would be if uh, Saddam Hussein does pull out of Kuwait. What will this do to him as, a, as an individual, as a person, to his personality? And, and what will his image be to other leaders in the Arab world when they begin to resume their own decision-making with, with less of the influence of the United States? It really, of course, would be a major setback, but I really want to emphasize he has been able to pull back in what would apparently have been major embarrassments in the past if he felt it was necessary for his survival, laying in wait, patiently plotting, 
uh, to, uh, to justify his, uh, his revolutionary immortality at a later time. So I think this is uh, quite possible. Uh, can he survive in power if he does that? There's no one around to take it from him. How will this affect the other Arab leaders? I think this is of less consequence to him than his image to the individuals below the leaders, and I believe he probably sees himself as having much wider support than the present uh, world actions would see, and it is not the leaders who support him, but the people. New York City, what's your question or comment about Saddam Hussein? Yes, so I'd like to know where your, what makes your guest think he's such an expert on Saddam Hussein. He seems more to me like uh, he's just shit out in anti-Hussein rhetoric. Those other dictators or so-called royal families or leaders in that area are just as vicious. There's no room for dissent in the Arab world or according to the leaders and anybody rising with dissent or punished in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries. Well, let me, uh, let me respond to that only by saying that I think to ex the the basic way of trying to do an assessment of a leader uh, uh, at a distance is certainly not something that uh, requires specialized psychiatric expertise. It does require thinking of patterns, patterns over lifetime, patterns in reacting to crises, patterns in reacting to people. And there's a very consistent story that Saddam Hussein has told through his actions over his life of eliminating enemies, eliminating countries, letting nothing stand in his way, in a way which, in, to my way of thinking at least, puts him at the extreme end of a, of a, of a spectrum of, of ruthless leaders. Durlock, California. Go right ahead with your question or comment. Yes. Uh, I heard the other day in the news Caller, that I need you to lower the volume on your TV. We're getting a lot of feedback. Can you do that very quickly? I heard the other day in the news about Saddam Hussein is a liar, and uh, Mr. Uh, the President Bush told that he's a liar and everything. And uh, I know I'm, I don't know I'm confused because other day I heard the news conference about uh, Mr. Bush that uh, Iraq threat Saudi Arabia, and same day I heard the King Hussein that uh, the news conference that uh, Saudi Arabia was missing informed by the invasion. Now, by who was misinformed and why? Well, there's certainly an abundant pattern throughout Saddam Hussein's life of making commitments and breaking them, of lying if it serves his convenience, uh, a, a week before uh, the uh, invasion when he was massing troops on the Kuwait border. He assured us unequivocally uh, that there was no possibility of, of his invading, and, and we, history has uh, shown this. Um, I'm, I'm not really privy to uh, uh, other, other data, but there certainly is a very consistent pattern of one not being able to uh, trust his word. Virginia Beach, Virginia, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mr. Post, uh, I, was just, you, I was listening to you earlier, going over his profile as you see it. Somebody, uh, right after this happened, they started having handwriting on an analyst go over his handwriting as far as uh, what type of person he is by that. Now, I don't see a whole lot in that myself, but somebody who uses chemical weapons on their own people and just here shortly ago was trying to get parts for nuclear devices uh, into his country. Now, do you think, and uh, reports say that he's only just a couple years away from getting them, uh, Somebody who uses, like, like I said, chemical weapons on his own people and is that close to getting uh, nuclear abilities, do you not see any, uh, any off balance there as far as the individual personality goes? Thanks. Oh, I see a great deal off balance in terms of his personality. Uh, and indeed, the prospect of nuclear weapons in his hands is an absolutely terrifying one. When I was saying he was not a madman, I was meaning that this was not a man who was psychotic, who was hallucinating, who belongs in the back ward of a, of a mental hospital, uh, but there surely are many, many distortions uh, to, to his, uh, his, his personality. And indeed, no concept of the humanity of his victims. He, he dehumanizes his victims as best as I can tell, and he simply gets rid of people uh, or countries uh, as if they were a stone in his path. 
you have a sense of his attitude towards the wealthy sheikdoms in the region, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait? How does he feel about those very uh, powerful families? He has extremely strong negative feelings uh, about them, which go back to his being steeped in the Ba'ath Party uh, ideology, who saw the history of the region as one of the Arab world being dispossessed uh, and divided, first at the hands of the Ottomans, then at the hands of the Western mandates, uh, then at the hands of the monarchies who, they, who he saw as being controlled uh, by the West, and finally at the hands of the so-called Zionist entity, to use uh, his phrase. But he has very strong feelings about uh, the inequity uh, of these leaders controlling their oil wealth and of the wealth not going into the hands uh, of, of, of the common man. Of course, he would lead, like to lead the common man towards that destiny. Winter Park, Florida, thanks for waiting. Go right ahead. Hi, Ed. I miss seeing your face on this program. Even with my glasses, huh? <laughs> Go right <laughs> However, ahead. Uh, I, I'm very disturbed about this whole thing, as a lot of people are. And I w my question is, when Congress has tried to put sanctions against Iraq and Hussein, and even the day before the invasion, the administration was trying to protect him from the sanctions. Then, two days later, we hear this man is a Hitler and uh, all these reprehensible things. Uh, since Dr. Post delves into psychology, how do you analyze the administration's two different positions overnight. Well, I'll, I'll not attempt to analyze the administration's two different positions, but let me answer your question uh, in, in, a, in a somewhat different fashion. What does it take to deal with a person who has no conscience and unbounded aggression and will take uh, whatever is in his way? And it takes, in my judgment, a consistent policy of firmness, of clarity, of setting limits and not being cowed by the, uh, that aggression. And certainly, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, since this invasion, I think there has been a, a very clear uh, uh, policy uh, by the administration in terms of what is not unacceptable. I think many have criticized uh, uh, the pre-invasion pattern for being too soft on Hussein and for not sufficiently uh, um, standing up to him. But the point has also been made that one attempts to work things out diplomatically before resorting to strong force. Before we go back to the phones, I'll tell you very briefly that our guest, Dr. Gerald Post, uh, is a professor of psychiatry, political psychology, and international affairs at George Washington University. And he's been in that position since 1987. Formerly, he was the director of political and military psychology for Defense Systems Incorporated. Uh, prior to that, worked as a senior research psychiatrist for the U.S. government, where he looked at the behavioral uh, assessments of key foreign personalities. Uh, founder and leader of the Center for the Analysis of Personality and Political Behavior. What is that, the uh, Center for the Analysis of Personality and Political Behavior? Well, as we've seen in, the, in this case, uh, we can take all sorts of satellite photos and, uh, and do a great deal in understanding our adversaries' uh, uh, capabilities, but what is crucial is to get into the, the mind of your adversary. And the, uh, the Center for the Analysis of Personality and Political Behavior is a unit of uh, behavioral scientists uh, brought together to try to understand leadership at a distance. He's a graduate of Yale and received his MD from Yale also at the School of Medicine in 1960. Let's go back to the phones. Los Angeles, thanks for waiting. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I have a question about um I keep you know, hearing uh, people referring to the chemical weapons used in Iraq about uh, you know, killing the Kurds and all that, but it seems like you know, I don't know where they get the information from because the United Nations has sent people over there to check it out, and there has been no evidence whatsoever about it. So I'd like your comment on that. That's not my understanding. The uh, photographs and the evidence uh, have, have been uh, overwhelming that chemical weapons were used, and I must say, I think it is unfortunate to the extreme uh, that the entire world uh, did not uh, raise up its hands in horror and, uh, and, uh, and strongly decry this bestiality. 
Pittsburgh, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, hello, you're on the air. Go ahead. Doctor, I've read extensively over the years about World War II, and I haven't really followed the Middle Eastern situation so much over the years, but having been very involved with what's happened in the last couple of weeks, I'm beginning to get more of a more of a feeling that this is a little bit like 1939 during the phony war, and that this man really is a good deal like Adolf Hitler. And I think what's frightening me more than anything else right now is that I remember after the phony war when Hitler went into France rather than, uh, uh, or the, through the Ardennes rather than, than doing what the British and the French thought he was going to do. And I keep wondering whether this man, uh, Saddam Hussein, is thinking of going, say, through Jordan, uh, directly through to Israel. And I hope the administration is understanding this kind of a personality. The question is, is, is this kind of a personality the kind of man who would be thinking in this sense? Well, historical analogies are very useful, but sometimes misleading. And in the uh, complex and tumultuous area of the Middle East, uh, the role of Saddam Hussein is assuredly not like the, uh, uh, the role of Adolf Hitler uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, in, the, uh, in the 1930s. Having said that, there are certain features in common. They both are uh, destructive charismatics, as I, as I noted earlier. Both have the capacity to, uh, with very powerful rhetoric, to uh, mobilize uh, support. And certainly both need strong, firm containment from a, a unified world. Panama City, Florida. Nice to hear from you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention something. Like when the Americans dropped the atomic bomb on the Japanese years ago, nobody mentioned it as being inhumane or uncivilized. Now when Saddam Hussein is using the chemical bombs, everybody is uh, attacking him about it. And he's been using them for years against the Iranians, and nobody said anything. Now, just because all of a sudden the whole world is against him, you keep, you know, saying the same thing again and again. And I also want to say, why is President Bush sacrificing all those American troops to uh, defend some dictatorship in, the, in Saudi Arabia? Well, hopefully there will be no sacrifice of troops. What uh, uh, President Bush has done at the invitation of the Saudi Arabian government is make a very firm uh, display of strength and determination, which hopefully will stem the tide and, re and reverse the, this unfortunate circumstance. Stillwater, Oklahoma. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I would just like to state that um, if Saddam is um, trusted to leave Kuwait without causing any more trouble, he will just affect it another time, just like a shark. And also, may I just state that um, the people who are supporting him are terrorists like Yasser Arafat and uh, Gaddafi, who cannot themselves be trusted. And also, the funds that he used in his war against Iran and now against Kuwait, would it not have been better to use it within the country? Well, there are several, several aspects of that question. First, quite surprisingly, after initial support, in point of fact, Gaddafi and Arafat have now both decried uh, this episode uh, by uh, uh, Saddam Hussein. I absolutely agree with the first point you made. If he does go back, it is not the end. He will bide his time. Uh, this is a man, though, who does know how to go back. And uh, we are on the brink of, a, of what would be a, a, a major disaster. And one hopes this will be another occasion when he can recognize the magnitude of his miscalculation uh, and, and uh, beat back in reverse. I wish we had time to share with you a paper that I've been privileged to read that our guest, Dr. Geraldine Post, has written. It's entitled The Political Psychology of Saddam Hussein. I wanted to ask you about one point that you make um, in it. You say that while he is psychologically in touch with reality, he is often politically out of touch with reality. What do you mean? Well. No leader gets his, uh, is, is in total touch with the world. Uh, he receives information through his advisors. Uh, he executes his decisions and gets feedback uh, through the leadership circle around him and through contacts that he has made himself around the world. A, Saddam Hussein 
has is scarcely ever outside of the uh, of the Middle East, uh, and indeed has had very little contact with uh, with non Arabs. But he is surrounded by fear fearful sycophants who dare not criticize him. So there is uh, no one to say to him how popular or unpopular he is. His uh, miscalculations are seen as as uh, problems with the outside world, and and thus. He may be psychologically intact, but he can have a very distorted view of the world. Lexington Park, Maryland. Go right ahead with your question or comment. Uh, yeah, I'm in the military, so perhaps the Middle East is uh, hits a little bit closer home than to some. Some of us are a little bit worried about American people acting toward us the way they did the Vietnam veterans. So I'm taking your con career background into consideration, and my question is, has there been any sort of type of survey that tells us what the majority of American people feel about our involvement in the Middle East? I don't know about our involvement in general. My understandings uh, are that the, uh, uh, the surveys of the last week show a, an overwhelming uh, uh, support for the actions that uh, President Bush has, has taken, something in the range of 76%, uh, I believe, of the American public uh, supports this move as necessary. Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks for calling. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Post if he's ever, a couple questions. Have, first of all, uh, have you ever read the Koran yourself? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, so don't you think that, uh, 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 don't you think that uh, Saddam Hussein really looks at us as um, uh, subhuman? I think he looks at us as uh, as subhuman, uh, just as in his uh, in that essay of his uh, of his uh, uncle, uh, uh, three whom uh, God should never have uh, created: Persians, Jews, and flies. But not because of the Koran. This is not a deeply religious man, and his uh, trying to put on a mantle of this being a religious cause is really really absurd at this point. And anyone who's followed his history uh, uh, knows that uh, he is. This is not a man steeped in religion, quite different, for example, uh, from Khomeini, uh, who, who uh, with deep conviction, uh, promulgated the, uh, the Islamic Revolution. In case you've just joined us, we're discussing the psychological profile of Saddam Hussein with Dr. Geraldine Post, who is a professor of psychiatry, political psychology, and international affairs at George Washington University here in Washington. Honolulu, Hawaii, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Yes, Dr. Post. I was wondering, um, isn't it a double standard from the United States, I'm an American Arab, to actually react so quickly to Saddam Hussein, and for 25 years they haven't done nothing about the Israeli occupation of Palestine? Don't you think it's a good idea to at least show the Arab world that we will do something about Palestine, that we don't have to have somebody like Saddam do something about it in the name of God or in the name of whatever? Thank right. you. I might remind the viewer there's rather different circumstances between the uh, occupation of the, of the occupied territories during a war initiated by the Arab world and, uh, and Saddam Hussein uh, using naked force uh, in an initiating way to take uh, control of, uh, uh, of, of, of Kuwait. I see these as being really quite fundamentally different and don't believe they should be considered as equivalent. Kingwood, Texas, go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, I'd be interested what impact of the draft would be if it was reinstated. Impact of the draft. Um, I don't know if that's within your area of expertise, but you're certainly invited to comment on it. Well, let me try to place it in the context of what it might mean to Saddam Hussein. Uh, I believe, uh, despite his pretensions of uh, bravado, he must see this massive military buildup, the sending over of medical personnel, the calling up of the reserves as evidence of preparation uh, not only for uh, a strong resolve defensively, but potentially for an offensive war, and must be uh, extremely anxious um, underneath that pr pretense uh, on the surface. And indeed, some of the press conferences, not of his, but of his foreign minister, where they almost seem to be pleading, we want peace, please let us talk. I think this, this is, uh, uh, he is beginning to uh, react and, and, and be, uh, be frayed around the edges. Detroit, Michigan, go right ahead. Uh, yes, I uh, have a question for Dr. Post. Uh, did you ever see him? Did you ever talk to him personally? Uh, no, I didn't, and uh, this is uh, 
not an individual I would like uh, as a, a neighbor, be it a, as an individual or as a country. That is an interesting question because um, where did you get your information about uh, Hussein? Well, there's a substantial uh, open record uh, about Saddam Hussein. Uh, the biographic facts are basically not in dispute. Uh, uh, each of the uh, examples uh, of uh, treachery uh, and violence I've given are multiply uh, sourced. And uh, in some ways, being able to look at the story of a man's life apart from how one experiences him individually can, can keep from being uh, obscured by an often charming uh, individual. We have lots of charming individuals who are, who are scoundrels, and uh, uh, Saddam Hussein, I'm sure, at times can be quite charming. Los Angeles, California, go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, most of Jews in this country attack uh, Saddam Hussein because he threatened Israel. Uh, and do you know Israel are Jewish? Is this true or not? I don't see the reaction to Saddam Hussein now as being because he has uh, threatened Israel. I, I, I see it as uh, because of his having violated uh, uh, international norms and, uh, and showing a, 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 an insatiable appetite for power and, and domination. That was the, uh, the last call. I'm afraid we're running out of time. Before we leave you, I'd like to get your sense of uh, the reaction of the rest of the Arab world to the events of the last few weeks, what will it mean to Saddam Hussein if no other Arab nation rallies around his cause? I think it will be extremely upsetting on the one hand, but he has such a supreme belief in his own messianic leadership that he will see that as the failures in judgment of the leadership of those countries and know underneath it that the people support him. Um, I'm afraid we're almost out of time. I hope that uh, you'll come back again in the near future and talk to us about this 